Okay, we're back. We're live. We're Think Tech Talks. Um, actually, Island Perspectives, whatever it is, here on a Monday afternoon in the four to five block. Okay, and and with me, uh, you know, Sung Choi. You may remember him. He was here in the three to four block. <laughs> Dr. Sung Choi is the assistant dean of the College of Engineering at UH Manoa, and we were talking in the three to four block um, about the Asia Pacific Clean Energy Summit and Expo on September 9th, so try to come to that, it's fantastic. Okay, but now in the, in the four to five block, uh, we have Ted Ralston joins us. Ted is an ex-aerospace industry person and uh, also a consultant and a kind of entrepreneur person and very passionate about drones. That's why we're calling this Yet More Drones. And the reason we're talking about drones is because we talked about drones last Thursday uh, at the Plaza Club with an HVCA Think Tech program there. And both of these guys were on the panel, which was an excellent program, excellent panel. Uh, Peter Crouch uh, was uh, the dean of uh, uh, the School of Engineering. He moderated it. It was quite good. Anyway, so we're following up on that, and we're following up on a conversation that Ted and I had earlier today, which followed, the, everything followed that program, <laughs> things happened. So Ted, why don't you begin and tell us, you know, what the dynamic is here? What's going on? Sure, I'll give you my point of view anyway. I uh, appreciate being offered this opportunity to speak here, as I was on Thursday, appreciative of that uh, panel discussion and the people. What was going on in that panel discussion was four or five different perspectives or points of view on where drones and, and Hawaii come together uh, for our future. Um, coming out of that, it was evident that there were two basic themes, to my mind anyway, so I asked Jay for some time so we could get together earlier today and, and try to collect our thoughts on those two main themes and see if there isn't a place where they come together in some kind of congruency that can, that can tie these two themes together. What I saw was that there's uh, uh, a, uh, the, 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 the big pursuit by Hawaii, Oregon, and, and Alaska for uh, receiving the nomination as one of the six FAA test sites for drones, really important thing for our technical future and for our uh, economic future here. Also a good point for the perspective that Hawaii, in conjunction with the other two states, plays in the, in the Pacific Rim. Uh, so that's a really important function, and we ought to all get behind that as much as we can. There's a lot of aerospace knowledge in Hawaii. There's a lot of engineering knowledge in Hawaii. A lot of retired people like me who are willing to come forward and spend time on these things. And it would be really great, which I mentioned to you after the after the workshop after the uh, table, uh, the the, the, uh, the program round table, Thursday, right? Yeah. That we why don't we get together and see if we can sketch out some kind of a pathway that would bring these people in and their resources and their connections and networks into the picture. And strengthen our total approach. So that's what we. That's one of the themes we spoke of today, was strengthening the total the total uh, approach here we have in Hawaii, and we'll get into the specifics of that in a minute. But the other side of the equation is um, independent of that, but related to it, is the development at UH Hilo, which uh, the Chancellor Don Straney would like to generate, a program uh, at UH Hilo that deals with uh, the use of drones in a completely smaller scale. Uh, for Big Island and Hawaii uh, environmental monitoring, crop monitoring, precision agriculture, uh, seacoast systems, uh, monitoring and tracking the, evol the evolution of environmental uh, challenges and such, archaeology as well, and have it in such a way that there's, a, there's coursework where systems are evolved and, and software analysis programs are, involved, are evolved that would prepare kids for working in that environment when they graduate and at the same time we're going to have to generate a, a economic based business that can put those kids to work when they when they graduate so we have both the trained workforce and we have the the work they can perform so but the idea is to deal with the the island of Hawaii's issues and then expand that to the to the rest of the island chain because of the specific needs we have here in Hawaii. Hmm. And that can be done in a, in a dimension and a domain under say, four and a half pounds of, of total UAV, which is going to be a category that's going to be uh, on the easy do side of the FAA's uh, certification issues, more so than the, the larger drones that are going to be okay, more we complicated. Need, we need to talk certain. about that. Right. So, uh, okay, here we are, uh, Sung Choi. You were actually the guy who put that program together. You know, credit where credit is mm -hmm. due. Uh, you know, we it, it all started with a conversation between the two of us, and and uh, he took the bit by the bit by the horns, 
The, 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 teeth. the bit in the teeth. The bit in the yeah. teeth of the horns. This happens when it just fell into you. <laughs> <laughs> Before you know it, we had this fantastic panel, including Ted. So, um, how did it go in your view, and where should we go from here? And uh, you know, tracking and what Ted said. What do we What do we need to do? You know, that uh, panel session we had on Thursday was a great start to a discussion about a subject that we really need to uh, have a discussion on. Uh, I think there's many more, many more aspects and issues that needs to be discussed, uh, and it varies from the obviously the engineering and the education and the industry side, all the way to the, uh, the legal and the moral and all these other issues that are taking place. Um, I think this is a great way to see if we can begin that objective of changing our uh, economic base. I mean, sooner or later, our tourism numbers will go down, and if that is the case, we need to make sure we can buffer ourselves by having another uh, income generating uh, source. And high technology has always been an interesting and an important aspect of Hawaii. I mean, I think I mentioned it that day when we had the panel. Um, Aloha Net talks about I remember. sending packets back in the late 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s. Mm -hmm. People don't know this, but mm -hmm. if you want to know why internet is here the way we do, where we send pictures, it's because of the research that was done here 50 years ago. And, and it's your thing about islands. Mm -hmm. Islands have a special requirement for creativity. That's right. And they come they come without an agenda, they, so they have a carta blanca for creativity. Uh, you know, it's, it's that thing. It's, when you live on an island or you are in an isolated community, you have to come up with unique solutions. You cannot, you know, leverage yourself on some of the solutions that took place in big cities like New York or uh, big academic sectors like Boston. Uh, they have outside resources that's constantly feeding it in. People have asked me, why can't we be something like an industry source like Seattle or Portland? And I'm like, you know, Seattle and Portland have some of the largest manufacturing sectors in the United States. And they feed in to create that engineering-driven uh, education. And they ho always have that, eh, that whole chicken and the egg thing. Do we have the students come first and industries come second? Or do we bring the industry so it'll create the students? You have to do some of these things simultaneously. You can't wait for one to generate the other. And I think that's what we have that opportunity to do right here, right now. I mean, I know Ted because several years ago, he asked me uh, a very simple favor, and I just happened to have a student, a guy named David Homer, who was working and playing with these uh, quadcopter UAVs. And he was just willing to try to go and take some photos of some uh, areas, and boom, look what happens. You know, we're sitting here together discussing more about these things. So these type of discussions can and will lead to like the initiatives that Ted was talking about earlier where they're trying to set up uh, test sites here and maybe that's where we need to you know focus our energies so we can uh, create that type of uh, uh, industry and uh, aspect here. Let me, let me add this thought. Mm -hmm. um, you know back, uh, oh gee, the days of George Ariyoshi, you know, he designed a future <clears throat> in his plan for the state, his vision for the state, of a state that was more global, more internationally connected for sure, and a state that had technology. And he was there when uh, uh, the Manoa Innovation Center was mm -hmm. established, uh, God rest its soul. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, and I think because of things he did at the end of the, uh, of the you know, uh, 1900s, <laughs> we we seem to have a handle. I mean, we seem to understand we needed to diversify. We needed to do technology, innovation, economy kind of thing. Um, and Act Two Twenty One was passed, and then there was a whole rush of uh, information technology kind of tech around at MIC and elsewhere. And then that sort of migrated into energy. I mean, it. it, it I don't want to say it failed, but it went flat. Um, and then we migrated into energy, and everybody thought, well, energy is the new technology that technology was supposed to be. But the, but the reality with energy is that the guys doing the technology are really somewhere else. 
Uh, we, we aren't really doing so. We're doing installation and we're doing integration, but we're not doing this, you know, we're not designing panels. Uh, Hoku tried that and it didn't go very far. Um, so now, uh, finished with information technology and, you know, sort of taking technology from others on energy, we're left in a place where we have to decide what we want to do if we want to, you know, diversify into technology. Right now, six billion dollars a year is being spent on drones, and you know every indication is that's going to double around the country. It's 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 the new world. It's a new definition for war and also for civilian uses. So the question is, how do you see Hawaii getting in on that? I mean, can we be an international name in drones? Uh, can we have a robust industry that will actually meet the definition of you know a tech sector? and the definition of diversification. Can we do that? Are we able? Do you think we'll able? What do you think? Uh, as we said at the, at the uh, roundtable back on Thursday, drones aren't just the airframe, which is a manufacturing function. There's everything else in there. There's a sensor package. There's a sensor physics that goes along with it. There's some of that work being done not far from us right here in this building, right here in Honolulu and University. There's the command and control system. There's the knowledge of how to operate a complex system like that within the complex adaptive environment called the national airspace. There's the exploiting software that takes the imagery, which could be reflectance, it could be uh, of the true color, it could be uh, change detection, it could be object identification, all kinds of imagery exploitation in order to understand the picture you're looking at. Absolutely, that's, a, that's one part of it. So there's many sectors within that term drones, and we think we typically think of the air vehicle flying around, but the, the big business is not so much in the product of the producing of the air vehicle, it's in the subscription basis of all the software analysis and the new software coming along with that. Uh, so, uh, for, for example, on airplanes, uh, uh, as, as a, as a relative, relative example, the insides of airplanes and the engines return like 10 times the value of the airplane when you sell an airplane. And I think in the so drones, nice. yeah, in it's drones it's going to be... Yeah, the airplane's a bracket that has a bunch of stuff installed in it. Mm -hmm. And it's the stuff that you change all the time in an airplane. You don't ever change the bracket. Mm -hmm. The same is going to be here. You have a, a drone. What you're going to be doing is changing the, uh, so the sensor package, changing the command and control, changing the mission software, changing the analysis software, all the time changing it to meet what the mission is. And so really that's where the... Where the so where what the you're saying is. is there's a lot of work to be done on a lot of these component parts and the future is in designing, manufacturing the component parts rather than the, the whole drone. Well, I think that it's, and more than that, it's in the software that is independent of the drone, of the physical drone itself. The software that analyzes the imagery that's collected and stores that in data banks and compares it to what the past was, puts the change detection in, identifies to the farmer when it's time to get the bananas off and get them at the market, get them to market, or get the pesticides out there to take care of whatever is happening to Can the drone. Can we do this here? Absolutely, it can be done at home. Who will do it here? It was, everything starts with the university in terms of the creativity. Just happen to have university uh, right I, here next to right. you. Yeah. <laughs> there, there it is, right there. <laughs> the entirety of the University of Hawaii right here. Do you it's feel the center of the a little university. bit of expectation being delivered on you? Uh, uh, you know, yeah. not really, because uh, these research that you're talking about, Ted, are basic research that's been mm -hmm. done for several decades. Uh, it just hasn't been refined to the point that we can use it on a you know, right. continuous basis. And that's what we're trying to get to. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of it is a safety issue. You know, you want to be able to be repetitious enough that if you were to do it a thousand times, 10,000 times, 100,000 times, that there aren't failures. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, it, it's unfortunate that I'm going to bring these up, but with some of the accidents that's been ha happening throughout the world, it's not really the machine itself, but it's been the humans that, has been, that have been driving these things and everybody has always ha have said that statistically accidents takes place more because of human error than because of some of these mechanical or electrical or software errors. So yes, it'll be some time before we can fully accept the use of some of these things that we call quote unquote drones. But I mean, if you grew up watching the Jetsons with uh, automatically driven cars, <laughs> The, 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 you the can maids imagine and you the, can yeah, do. I mean, you know, it's, well, after we come back from this break, I, w I would like to talk about whether Hawaii can play a, a role in the integration of all the component and, you know, uh, contributing technologies mm -hmm. to this, whether we can be home base on it. This is uh, Think Tech Talks here on a Monday, 
Uh, and uh, we have with us uh, Ted Rawson, an, an ex aerospace executive or engineer, or both. 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 Woo! <laughs> and Sung Choi. Uh, I guess you can say the same. Yeah, uh, <laughs> executive and engineer with the College of Engineering. We'll be right back after this break. That's the sound of Sung Choi over my left, and to my immediate left, that's Ted Ralston. We're talking about yet more drones. <laughs> <laughs> we, I mean, forgive me this, but we're, we're droning on even more. more about yeah. it. So you Certain of us are droning on. <laughs> <laughs> so can we drone on about the question of integration, you know? Because it, it's nice to have little pockets of technology and research and development and all that to, in order to feed the maw of some sort of general contractor out there who tells us what to do, who approves our work, or disapproves it as the case may be. And, and we get sort of handouts, but we don't really control the development of the technology, of the, of the apparatus, of the device. So I'm asking whether Hawaii has a skill, the drive, what have you, the depth to be the integrator and be the, the mother hen on the development of the device in general. It, oh. Take a shot at that. I think what that means is, um, do, can Hawaii create the framework and the architecture for how drones are going to operate in a national airspace system in conjunction with airports and air traffic and uh, uh, small general aviation and such and industry in general? And that's really a systems architecture question more so than an integration question. Integration will always take place at the interface between two pieces. Anybody can do the integration. Okay. It's okay. the architecture is okay. where the value is. Thank you. And, uh, Architecture is beginning, architectures in this scale is beginning to be understood at the infrastructure level. Uh, the development of Kaka'ako downtown, for example, that's an example of an infrastructure that's going to have to think about the integration and the interaction uh, and, the, and the total architecture, not just of the single building, but the whole situation, the whole system. And so uh, we can do that here in Hawaii. It's, it's almost a uh, it's a combination of the thinking and engineering department, electrical engineering, probably leading the way there. And, uh, and, and the geography department understands this in a, in a big way as well. So does geography. archaeology. There, there's Tell me why geography is important. Geography this. starts to look at the picture as it plays out in a large um, tapestry through different layers. It looks at the physical layer, it looks at the economic layer, it looks at the uh, human layer, the cultural layer. It may look at uh, a foreign influence layer. There's all, the geography is beginning to see how pictures come together into a total state change of your understanding. And that's what we're talking about, a state change from individual components into an architecture. Uh, the, again, the engineering department is where you'll find the knowledge and skills probably out of the IT side of the house in terms of uh, durable software, software that can, that can operate without failure. We're talking about a whole new way of thinking about failure management. That's what we're really dealing with, failure management in large scale systems. Failures can occur, but they have to extinguish themselves as we go for as they go forward. They failure is not fatal, right? Fa fatal ha fa failures have to ha have to statement. collapse. They have to can't expand. You can't have any forward propagation of error. There's math that's mm -hmm. beautiful math like Markov chain modeling and such that fit into that picture. M A R K O F F A O V Markov. Markov, a person. Yeah, the Russian guy, and uh, he understood how 
how complex systems can be modeled so that you can even ev evaluate them. It, very complex systems are it, almost impossible to test and model. That's why this whole issue of the FAA testing, mm -hmm. I'm not sure they really thought it through what that really means. There's no way you can test the entire UAV operating system unless you generate the UAV operating system. Yeah. So you really have to replicate it at model level and you have to examine its operation and its failure response with many failures injected in human failure including uh, included such as air traffic controllers and, and, and malicious input has to come into it. That has to all be brought together in a, in a rapid acting model state which is probably a supercomputer such as the one on Maui which would gain a, a great upper hand on understanding how these complex systems behave. Then once you understand how be, they behave you can, you can put software safety in in such a way that the, that the propagation of errors cannot grow. So let me, let me get this straight. So you, you need to use the big computer for the testing and to make sure that failure doesn't propagate. That's itself. correct, yeah. But then when you have learned from this testing, then you write the software uh, for the drone. You write the software for the drone, you write the testing, the, the uh, 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 training protocols for the humans involved, you generate the communications protocols, and what, what do you do when you have a failure? So the simulation oh. thing. The yes. simulation and testing, it's not necessarily on the drone, it's done beforehand, oh, way beforehand in order to establish the best drone. It's established the best architecture in which a drone can operate, and then that'll also provide constraints for how the drone has to operate within that architecture. God, this is so interesting, and so it's so sexy, it's, a, it's, it's a, so sophisticated. And, and it's yeah. a, <laughs> sign them up. <laughs> and, and it's an island mentality that you, again, to the point you were making earlier, uh, island is a, is a dependent universe of its own. It's dependent upon the supply chain. It's dependent upon the health of the, of the uh, ports that feed us and then the place we do our trade partners. In, in the same way, this is similar. It's an architecture that's dependent upon the health of all the components and the knowledge of all the components and an ability to correct for the errors that might occur. Well, it's almost components. like we need a, a drone college, you know, a drone college at UH <laughs> Manoa or something where everybody's focused on drones. I mean, really, it's, it's within the College of Engineering for sure. But don't you have to live in a, effectively live in a universe of drones, like you're doing with the underwater vehicles? Because Sung Choi does plenty of that. Um, so the, the question is, I mean, how do I create a juggernaut that will be a world-class place for R&D in drones and draw attention from everywhere, including the FAA? Well, well, I think Ted brought up a lot of good points and you brought, brought up a point that's very important. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're sitting here and we argue about things about, oh, what do we do here? You know, if we have industry here, can we manufacture it and all this stuff? You know, Industry has changed. Uh, as Ted mentioned, if we're talking about a, a drone, and let's say a UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, besides the vehicle itself, there are all the little components that go into it. And they don't require this huge area of manufacturing. You can be doing it here in the studio, and it'll be more than sufficient to get the products out we want. For instance, let's say, as Ted was saying, we're looking at a little CPU unit that analyzes all the sensor signals that's coming in. We don't need 100,000 you know, acres of land to do this. We need a little space with simulated signals. You know, we have computers, and they can range from computers that are that small to these big computers in Mali that can generate signals and data that emulates exactly what the physical uh, unit would do. And using that data, we can run scenarios many, many different scenarios. And if you go through enough scenarios where you have the worst case uh, situations, we can now look at an architecture, as Ted was putting it, that can be conducive to controlling all this space. Now, good thing about Hawaii, hey, we're isolated. That's why they tested those little uh, Aloha net packets here. They didn't want to disrupt anything else that was going on the rest of the world. They brought it here, we tested our cell phones back in the 80s when they were trying to see if that technology was actually going to be able to go through the rest of the world. And look at it now. You can't live without a cell phone. But if it had failed, you failed in Hawaii. That's okay. It's Somebody okay. will know. We'll just okay. do it. Right. Right. Be quiet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what we do. We are a place where we can be not only the test bed, but we can be that launching pad of new technologies. 
And I think, as Ted put it, there are techno technological developments that doesn't require all the space and humdrum. We can do it here. We, and people say, do you have the talent? Man, we have a lot of intelligent people. Not only the students that are coming out, but as Ted mentioned, many retired people with all this cumulative knowledge that I'm sure they're willing to teach somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I think that's what we're here to do. I think we're here to teach whatever we learn to that next generation so they don't make that same mistake. That and they can make the extraordinary mm -hmm. uh, discoveries. Yeah. But you know, you talk about, you know, one of the words, am I right about this? One of the words that somebody selected last Thursday was miniaturization. Oh, yeah, two of us did. <laughs> who, who was that? Help Both me. of us did. I'll thank you for that too. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Miniaturization. So, you know, and I'm thinking uh, our early discussion about the four and a half pound yeah. drone, which fits within the, what do you call it, the bureaucratic experience yeah. of the FAA, so it may be more acceptable to them. And, and that's good for commercial drones. So I, I see the four and a half pound drone as having enormous capability with these miniature mini, mm -hmm. miniaturized things mm -hmm. that are developed here because we become we become a technology industry that specializes in miniaturizations but then what I can't figure out and I know we're going to talk about commercial not military but I can't figure out the predator the, the one on the screen behind us you know which okay. is a, a big piece of gear so if I figure out all this stuff for a four and a half pound tiny little drone about that big what is that big really small at four and a half pounds, can, can I can I drive the big drone with the same kind of thing? So if I if I have X much of electronics driving the little one, and that same small handful of stuff will drive the big one, why do you need a big one? <laughs> I'll take a shot at that. Things have gotten smaller. As, as time goes on, you won't need the big one. That's that's the answer to the question. Now there's other factors here as well. Uh, the, those long-range uh, drones can launch from one continent and go to the other. Fuel. We're not we're not talking about fuel. that. We're right. talking about yeah fuel. Fuel volume on the airplane is a big factor, and then uh, the other issue is uh, what you might call R cubed or the distance between the sensor and the thing you're sensing. In the sense of uh, four and a half pound or one and a half pound drones over Richard Haas uh, Hamakua Springs Farms, we're talking about being 50 feet above the bananas. And, and we have a very short distance to generate the, re the response to reflections. If we're looking at uh, 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 IEDs from 30,000 feet or from you know 20 miles away, look trying to find people, that's a whole different game, so you need a lot more power. As you get in close, miniaturization really pays off. And the other side of miniaturization that's coming out of UH that's interesting is the microsats. Uh, they're making uh, what is microsatellites, small okay. uh, nanosats, microsats, cubesats. Cubesats. Yep. They all depend on um, very small, energy efficient sensors. And there's no reason those same sensors can't be put on UAVs. And they have tremendous advantage in terms of R cubed that's right. and, uh, and energy consumption that's right. and reliability. That's right. you, you, Something goes into orbit; it's got to be reliable. You can't go up there and fix it. So the whole issue of reliability is something that's learned from that side. So that's once again a UH functionality to be brought into the picture. But going back to where I was talking a bit ago, I really like bringing the social sciences into this as well. The uh, geographers and the archaeologists understand how to take these surface problems and express them in analytical you terms. You say archaeologists? Yeah. Here we yeah. are talking about drones, and we've sort of you know done this mind trip to archaeology. Can you, can you tell the people the relationship of archaeology sure. and drones? Archaeology is a, is a controlled scientific thinking process that looks at evidence and tries to put hypotheses into it and tries to extract answers coming out the other end from sometimes it's very... It's a thought process. It's a thought process. That structured thought process is what the same thing is required for looking at seacoast erosion like in Kailua Beach mm -hmm. today or observing the evolution of a construction project, just looking at it and understanding from an archaeological viewpoint how it's moving. Mm -hmm. Uh, protection of the environment, certainly. Um, protection of incursion of uh, noise generating sources on people's livelihood and such. So the thinking process of archaeology is really a great way to to sort of think through what the archae architecture looks like that our sensor systems and our reporting systems need to think about. And geography is the means by which all that's displayed in a multi-layer. So it's multidisciplinary, totally. involving oh, disciplines that are really uh, uh, different. 
right uh, and unrelated really except for this well we should relate them and, and we, we and, must yeah. relate them yeah so i mean but that, doesn't that go for the proposition that we need a call a drone college <laughs> <laughs> we're back to that one again <laughs> okay yeah. well i mean uh, I, yep. I think as we discussed on thursday these drones are unmanned systems and unmanned systems can be something as simple as your air conditioned temperature system at home. You know, you turn it on, you set it on 70 degrees, and you're happy as whatever to what that it's 70 degrees. And it's not 90 degrees like it is outside today, right? And, and people forget that unmanned systems can be almost anything. And we use it, we live with it, <laughs> and we forget that, hey, that's the same thing as that thing that's flying around. It's just that there's a dis different descriptor to it. And you know, if, if you're gonna be accepting these things, it really does make your life easy. I would love to get a car that drives itself. Because after know, this, I can go sleep in the back seat and go home. <laughs> well, we're talking about this, and uh, we're talking about the anti-avoidance anti -avo of collision, collision avoidance, <laughs> I forget the term, uh, this morning. And uh, I'd like, after the break, I'd like to, come back to that and, and, and see how, how you do that and how important it is in, a, in the, the coming world of drones. That's Sung Choi. He's the assistant dean at the College of Engineering, UH uh, Manoa. And that's Ted Ralston. He's a, a retired, well, not really retired, an ex-aerospace <laughs> okay. executive and engineer. And he knows a lot about drones. We'll be right back after this break. Okay, this is Think Tech uh, broadcasting live on Ustream, Spreaker, uh, and you can find the links uh, on thinktechhawaii.com. We also post on YouTube, so we're all over the place, and we also do Olelo, so you can see it there too. Uh, and with me today, Ted Rawson, a, an ex-aerospace executive and engineer, and Sung Choi, the assistant dean at the College of Engineering. It's great to have you guys here. Good to be here. So I wanted to uh, explore, you know, this whole thing about uh, collision avoidance, because in the world I see, which is maybe it's a world of comic books, see all these drones flying around doing all these things. You can talk about all the functionality, and they're all out there in this, you know, in the airspace, all doing their thing. So how do they avoid hitting each other? You know? That's that's uh, certainly a uh, sort of logical logical extension of the see and avoid aspect that aviation has been built around for years now. It's some more uh, uh, sense and avoid or um, be allocated and avoid. Airspace around the airplane is the responsibility of the pilot or the ground controller, as the case may be, and that, that space belongs to that pilot, that airplane. Uh, as we move into the world of drones, uh, we're going to have to realize that there are certain spaces that airplanes just aren't present in, such as uh, number 400 feet below that is a, not a place for airplanes to be unless you're landing in an airport. So, so that could be the zone, the uh, the drone zone. It could be the drone zone. You, for, you heard it here on <laughs> Think Tech. It's the drone zone <laughs> for 
for drones that are not going to be in any other way hazardous or uh, or generate any kind of problem. So very small drones, uh, the pound and a half, the size of a seagull, four and a half pounds, the size of a turkey vulture, uh, they fit quite well in that uh, 400 foot domain and airplanes just aren't there. And so by that kind of uh, separation, it's possible to generate the, the sea and avoid by pure separation. Then, however, the system has to be 100% reliable. If it's a drone that's not allowed to get above 400 feet, it can't get above 400 feet. So a combination of the payload and the drone together. Even in a storm. Even, even in an updraft. Under no conditions can it get, exceed that. And it has to have uh, a very reliable uh, fault tolerant systems that prevent that from happening. And that can be done. And it's a combination of the payload, which has its own sensors. It knows what altitude is. It knows what its geolocation is. Same for the airplane. They, they, can, co they can collaborate. And if anything ever starts exceeding that limit, just shut the power off. Well, it's, it has so, to be fail safe because exactly. you know, life and limb is in jeopardy if it's not. If it's not, it is. That's correct. So you stay away from the catastrophic size and weights, and then you separate by region. And that's a really logical way to do it. And it's the simplest way to approach it. And it doesn't require any onboard sensors that look at each other and do collision avoidance by that means. It does collision avoidance by zone avoidance. And uh, as we get into the bigger airplanes that have more power on board, more competence, but also fewer of them, that's when you get into the very exotic uh, sense and avoid aspects where you sense each other. And we're going to, it's going to be a long time before we see that in the uh, in You're the working with this at the College of Engineering in the underwater vehicles, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, sensors are a big part of I, I read your bio, I know. I think with any remote or autonomous systems, sensors and actuators and power are the main bottlenecks. So if you have, let's say you're going to some place that's dark. If I have unlimited power, I don't need to change the type of sensors. I can just light the place up. <laughs> you know, who cares? I just use a regular camera, light the place up, read, you know, see everything, and just move around it. But a lot of the solutions we come up with are interim solutions. We're going from point one to this goal up in the sky where we're supposed to be emulating what humans do. You know, as long as there's light, we can pretty much see and move around and do what we want. And we want the machines to work like we do. Because that, that's, that's the type of expectation we have. And to get there, as Ted said, it's going to be a long time. You know, you, you see glimpses of it. Now you have cars that can parallel park on your own. Yeah. So does that mean they're going to take that off your driver's ed? Why not? I mean, well, they really why should. Why do you have to do driver's ed and learn how to parallel park when, you, when the car can do it for you? Right? It's like doing math the old way. Who needs it? <laughs> well, you know, look at the SAT exams. Oh, you can take a calculator in there yeah. and punch in the numbers. Yeah. You don't have to learn how to add or subtract or yeah. multiply. You just have to know how to do it. Right? So, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you're talking about miniaturization. And, and I just have to bring this up. You know, back in the 60s when we put the Apollo on the moon, I think the computer they used was about size, I don't know, probably 10 times the size of this room, maybe bigger. I have more power than that in my hand on an iPhone. I mean, come on. Look at what's happened with miniaturization. So if a sensor happened to be about the size of a, a football back 10 years ago, that sensor may only be about that big now. And as Ted mentioned earlier, that means two things. Number one, it creates a smaller payload for your vehicle. And number two, you use less energy. Thus, also a smaller payload because you need less power. The size of the vehicle is purely dependent on payload. And the payload can be two things. All these sensors and power and actuators that you carry to do the functions you need, plus a payload is also something that you have to put into place to bring something back out. If I'm going into a cave and I'm bringing back a 20 pound a rock, I don't need an oversized vehicle to do that. However, I can't send in a you know, a uh, four inch or five inch vehicle because the payload is going to overload the, the vehicle itself. So it's always that whole thing, the right tool for the right job. These UAVs, drones, unmanned systems are nothing more than a sophisticated new tool.
Yeah. Oh, but the most sophisticated ever because they're right. effectively flying robots. That's right. And they can do anything that way. I think we're, we're missing, or we should be thinking about one more component. That's the software exploitation on the ground. Because as uh, Song was mentioning, the payload contains a lot of functionality. But if you can do that functionality in the ground processing instead of onboard the airplane or the vehicle, you can save that weight and save that uh, articulation and complexity in the payload as well. And uh, we have computer power not only in your handheld, but also on our laptops and such that is very power powerful these days. And uh, exploitation tools that can do the trigonometric corrections and the various other mathematical adjustments to the data on the ground. And don't bother with a gimbal well, payload. You or you pointed earlier, I mean, yeah. for every drone, there has to be a ground exactly. control thing. Uh -huh. And the ground and processing. Exactly. And that's where the, where, the, uh, where the big return value is. In, um, in, in some cases, it may, may dramatically outstrip the value of the, the economic value of the drone itself. It's that software and the processing and the conversion of that into a service that advises governments and people as to what to do yeah. based on that, that, that analysis. Well, this, you know, this, uh, this sort of shape, reshapes my model in my mind a little bit. I'll tell you, my model is different now. <laughs> okay. Good. You know, uh, somebody at the panel talked about this uh, fuel cell technology. Uh, <laughs> okay, different, different. It's a different idea than you know. The, like I think Jeff Williams and Williams Aerospace was doing something with fuel cells on his on his uh, drones, um, but that's very efficient, right? And it's it can be well, very efficient, right? <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe. But, but I'm just using it as an example. Uh, so we can make drones that are more sophisticated, more efficient yes. in terms of the, what do you want to call it, the, the fuel and the engine systems and so forth. And, 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 and maybe even, this is my real question, maybe even solar. Mm -hmm. Maybe even we can make a miniature with very lightweight stuff, have the heavy work, the heavy lifting, so to speak, done on the ground so that the drone itself is really light it has a huge capability for the, the weight involved. And then we can use solar, really efficient solar, to power the thing. And then it doesn't have to go very fast. It just has to keep going and stay in touch with us. Isn't this the future of drones? Solar is a, is a whole different uh, aspect of this thing. It's a very diffuse uh, source of power. And uh, airplanes generally consume much more power uh, than is available through solar other than these gigantically large 100-foot span test aircraft. So in the case of the, 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 the frequent, the, the re reoccurring drones we're going to see a lot of, they're going to be battery powered for some time to come and battery de power density is increasing every year as well. So solar cells on the ground charging the system is a more logical initial application and as solar cells become more efficient perhaps they can have a role in the onboard uh, continuous operation. Certainly the the really high efficiency, long wing uh, sailplane type uh, drones or balloon type drones that benefit from solar power, but the smaller ones that are very high power density are, are not going to be seeing anything other than the ground charging solar cells. Do you, you, uh, do, you, do you see drones as going slower in the future? Slower? Slower. Because you, don't, you know, you want to do their thing. You don't necessarily have to have them get in and out quickly. You just want to do a good job. I don't know if slower is the right word. Maybe precise and accurate. Okay, they can still be moving fairly quickly. And what you're talking about is a hovering aspect. Yeah. Which is one of the things that I showed you with my underwater Yes, you vehicle. did. Yes. It, and if you can hover in a three-dimensional space, now you're opening up yourself to doing many, many different types of tasks that you probably wouldn't have even thought about. You know, I mean, doing uh, complete construction in three-dimensional air. A, a no, sky crane. Uh, yeah, a sky with no crane. ties yeah. to the ground. Yeah, th those kind of things would be incredible. Uh, but you do open up a very interesting line of discussion here, which uh, this is the one area we probably aren't well equipped for here in Hawaii, which is aircraft configuration development. I don't think we have any of that going on here. And that's, that's something we, that we, we don't could. Have the, you don't think no. we can be able to do that? Well, I think we could. We just don't have it now. Mm -hmm. But the issue of uh, operating drones in the Pacific uh, Topography is a very challenging topography. We have the vertical cliffs, which have strong updrafts on the <coughs> windward side, strong downdrafts on the leeward side. You get close to a cliff and you lose a lot of the GPS because you're cutting out oh, half okay. the sky. And so there's there's configurations of drones that are going to work well in our environment here, the Kotwalaos and the Waianais and such. 
uh, that uh, aren't, you're not going to find in Kansas or in Nebraska or someplace like that. So a, a Pacific-oriented aircraft configuration that's efficient and effective and survives in this environment is a really interesting challenge. And that's probably going to be, that's going to be, tend to be a low speed system just because it needs a lot of uh, uh, wing area and uh, to operate in this environment. But I, I think a, a channel that thinks about that is going to be an important aspect of a Hawaii oriented program. And you need the geography, you need the. Oh, we have, we got the topography, we got it right here. To figure out, in order to make the drone respond to changes in topography and so forth. All right. You know, I don't know why, but I'm reminded. I got to tell you guys a short story. When I first came out here in the 60s, I was in the Coast I remember Guard. your short story from Thursday that went yeah. on for about 20 minutes, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll try to hold back. <clears throat> the Coast Guard was testing a, a, an underwater drone, and the thing was supposed to uh, go you know, into inshore, and when it hit a certain obstacle at a certain depth, it was supposed to turn around and come back out. I'm not sure why, but that's, that was the plan. Instead of doing that, it changed depth Okay, and it came in, and each time it reached an obstacle, it changed depth in more shallow water. Well, <clears throat> after a while, this was in Waikiki, right off Waikiki. So, so this drone, the year is, mind you, the early 60s, right? The, the, drone, the drone came up and went further and came up and went further, and there it was in the surf, you know, like 10 knots coming straight in at the beach. And all these Japanese tourists are sitting on the beach and they see this huge thing, looks like a bomb, <laughs> coming in with a torpedo spinning in the back. That's my story. Oh, that's a good story. It was really exciting. I guess to collision avoidance software work. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's that kind of thing, dealing yes. with the topography. Exactly. And there's a point to be made there for the Hawaii as a test bed concept. People can imagine what topography looks like. They can look at a picture and you can imagine that you can look at 3D. And mm -hmm. you still don't get it until you're here on the ground in, in some place in, under, the, under the shadow of the Ko'olaus. And suddenly you realize this is a serious challenge. And I think that uh, the fright factor of, of just that nature of that topography it, it alone is a, you, is a reason why Hawaii ought to be one of these sites. Because I agree. I agree. things have to work. And this is a real environment. It's a challenging environment. And, and it, it's not going to happen if the Middle West takes. Okay, well, let's take, a, let's take one last break. This is uh, Think Tech. I'm here with Ted Ralston uh, and Sung Choi. We're talking about uh, yet more drones, and we're exploring the corners, if you will, oh, of, the, of the initiative and the technology. We'll be right back after this break with more. Okay, we're back, we're live, we're Think Tech, we're here watching the clock <laughs> with Sung Choi and Ted Ralston. We're talking about yet more drones. And of course the conversation in the break is always is always so interesting. We wish you could hear the conversation in mm -hmm. the break. But, but Ted had some interesting ideas about my comment about the corners. Go right. for it. I think the, the corners concept is really interesting. And we we're talking earlier up this morning and then at a the break about the notion of testing drones, which is the subject that is uh, interesting to us because of the application that Hawaii, uh, Oregon, and Alaska have put in. 
When you test something as complex as an aerospace system, a UAV or a regular airplane, you don't test everything throughout. That would, you'd go f you'd do your whole life testing. What you have to do is simulate the system in its operating environment with faults, with weather, with malicious input, with everything you can think of that can go wrong, and you find the areas where it's most stressed. Where is that system most likely to have a difficult to handle situation, a potential accident situation, whatever it might be? Those are the corners of the envelope. And that's what you, that you, then you subject those areas to the actual test. And then you can feel, if you're okay at those points with the actual system, you're confident that the points in between are successful. So the corners of the envelope is an interesting, interesting uh, notion to bring into the picture here. But it really describes how you think through what a test program looks like. This is so exciting to do this. So I want to ask you guys, you know, for the, the last part of our discussion, what's the first step? You know, where, where do we what, put the left foot out, the right foot out? What do we do now? I can give you my idea on that, if that's okay. I'd like to like to see a workshop come out of this thing we had last uh, Thursday, and, and generate invitations and such, and, and have two two themes looked at. One theme: How do we generate a a, a program for UH Hilo as a center that deals with uh, local environment and agricultural monitoring at very small scale that we can start quickly and get the program going. And and that's one theme. The other theme is the notion of a complex adaptive systems modeling and simulation based UAV test domain, a virtual test range using the supercomputer as a big part of it and the actual test facilities or test areas we have here as the other part of it. Uh, how, getting people who are retired, getting people who are in this business, getting people who want to contribute to it, have those two themes discussed with safety and reliability being the common denominator that ties them together using university thinking at the IT and engineering level to as the sinew that ties them together at the bottom. Where does the so, money come from? This is going to have to be a volunteer effort for people like me, and the and, uh, university, of course, doesn't have volunteers necessarily, but it's got conscripts such as Song who can come <laughs> to the table. Uh, let's find out. Yeah. Let's find out. Okay, if people well, really, well, well, I, I think Ted brings up a very good point. Uh, you know, the, la the little uh, discussion we had last Thursday, I met a couple of guys that are out at Kailua that are working out of their garage and they're working with these uh, UAVs. And their proposal was, let's start a workshop so we can teach the students. And I, I think that's great. It's like our symposiums and conferences and these uh, little panel sessions. It's really about educating people around you as to what you're trying to bring in. Uh, people are always hesitant when you have, especially new technologies, trying to come into your neighborhood. But it seems to me people have accepted the Roomba as a way of cleaning their <laughs> house. Mm -hmm. And that's a draw, right? And, uh, and I think it's the same way. I, I, I think, as Ted mentioned, we need to get the universities to be focal. And, and that those universities being focal, where Hilo is doing this thing for the agriculture side. Uh, maybe we have Manoa doing the thing about uh, the actual unmanned system development and how the software works. And, and then they can actually go out to Hilo and actually test it out there on one of the farms because now it's a safe environment and space that they can do it in. If you can tie those together with the simulations that you're running at Maui using the high performance computers to make sure that if I take that software I developed on my simulator and put it on the real vehicle, that it will be 99, 99.5, 99.9% .9 is the same. In, in terms of performance. You're looking at the fact that you are spending very little money in trying to perfect something, and you're gonna go out and test it anyway. So eventually, it should come to a point where those things all tie in, and it comes back in a circle. And you, if you run these things in a circle up and up, you will get that energy as well as that whole process on how to get that technology to be developed. I, I agree with Ted. I, I think you can develop anything you want here. And, and the other thing that Ted was talking about is really very interesting is I, I agree with him. He's talking about as corners, I talk about as limits. You know one of the largest material science testing takes place here in Hawaii because we have things like snow, salt air conditions, tropical weather conditions, dry desert conditions. We have all these different conditions that can come in and we are trying to test the worst case scenarios. And if you can survive worst case scenarios, everything else should be pretty much, you know, piece of cake. 
So how fast, trust. how fast do we have to move on this? I mean, there are other, the other states want a piece of that uh, FAA uh, uh, testing program. Um, and the world in general, you know, I mean, it's, the U.S. has no lock on this. It's not like it's all classified and, you know, covered up. Uh, what, what we've been talking about in this show is not classified. It's entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. So how fast should we move if we want to get into a position to have a, may I say, a corner <laughs> <laughs> on the drone research market? What should we be doing? I mean, how fast should we be doing it? I think we can't wait. Yes. <clears throat> I think it's the whole thing about the Internet. Internet is not about finding information. It's how quickly can you find information. And I think it's the same thing. Yeah. Okay, 30 seconds to close. Go first. 30 seconds to close. I think we have to get the communities. That includes the, uh, uh, the social aspects, the government, the university, the industry, all on the same page and try to drive for a focus goal that can help the state out as a whole. Ted? I think the, um, that, that's a, a great architecture overall, and we need to figure out those three channels underneath, the small drones that we can develop right now, the large-scale notion of uh, modeling, simulation, and testing, and then the, the, the design aspects of safety engineering in the middle that ties them together. I think those are the architectural underpinnings of this future. You should both stay alive and well so you can participate <laughs> in this initiative. Sung Choi, the Assistant Dean at the College of Engineering, Ted Ralston, ex-aerospace executive and engineer. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Think Tech Talks. It's Monday. We've had a great time. Say aloha. 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 I knew you'd say that. <laughs> they can do it in Africa. We can do it here in Hawaii. <laughs> Just